This will be a first for me. Gold ocelotus are both the first shell dweller and actually the first hardwater fish I've ever worked with, and that's where I want to start today. My tap water is fairly soft, and initially, my plan was to remineralize my tap water to give the fish the high pH and mineral content that you would find in their natural habitat. I did that for a while and realized quickly that once I had a tank full of fry, the necessary frequency of water changes would really be hard to keep up with, and I would probably end up causing massive swings in water parameters. And that, I think many of us would argue, is even more dangerous than having stable but suboptimal parameters. Fish can adapt, and that's what I let mine do. I set up the tank with fine aragonite sand and dry base rock. Those both have a slow buffering effect, and what they've done for me is keep the pH at around 7.5 to 7.6. The mineral hardness is still low, but the fish seem to be doing fine. I've tried a range of water temperatures, and they seem to be pretty comfortable at 80 degrees, but I've gone as low as 76 or 77. These large pieces of aragonite rock I've found to be very helpful in managing the temperament of the fish. Ocelotus are well known for aggression, so I used the rocks to break up the tank into distinct territories that would give each fish their own space. Now, as their name would imply, these fish like to claim large, empty snail shells as a shelter. They don't hide in them all day, but they do like to stay close to their own shell, and they'll dart inside if they feel threatened. When it comes time to breed, they also use the inside of these shells as a safe place to lay their eggs. These aren't quite the shells they're used to in the wild, but the common hobbyist solution is to give them large escargot shells. After finding a shell on the surface of the sand, shell dwellers will spend hours converting it into a home. First, they excavate sand from under the shell until it sinks down about halfway below the level of the sand, and next, they dive face first into the sand nearby and use fin motions to throw loose sand on top of the still exposed portion of the shell. I've been watching this for months, and it seems to me that the shells always end up in this specific orientation. If you feel like helping your fish get set up in a new space, you can do them a favor and dig a shell into the sand just like this, and they'll happily take it from there. In general, you want to have at least one shell per fish, but more never hurts. You might notice that in this tank I have some loose shells sitting up on top of the rocks. Early on I noticed that if a particular fish was getting bullied by the others, they would end up hiding in an upper corner of the tank. I figured, if it's safe up high, let's put some shells there. If I see those shells occupied, it's a good indicator to me that I need to rework the territories a bit or even reduce stocking density. So now let's focus on getting some babies made. With all the pieces in place to make a comfortable tank, they really don't take much convincing. If you get a male and female in the same space and feed them well, they're probably going to spawn for you. I will say though, sexing can be a bit tricky. The most commonly mentioned dimorphisms I'm aware of are fin color and body shape. In a perfect world, you could say males are larger with a longer and more slender body shape. They also have gold outer edges to their dorsal fins, while females have white edges. In practice, it can be really hard to tell, and there's a fair bit of variability in coloration and body shape. My suggestion would be to use those as rough guidelines, but then just to watch the way the fish interact with each other and try to spot spawning behavior when it happens. From what I've seen, breeding is typically initiated by a female. Once she's ready to spawn, she'll try to get the attention of a male and lead him back to her shell. If the male is interested, he'll follow the female back to the shell to fertilize the eggs inside. You might see them both enter the shell together, but more often I saw the female go deep into the shell while the male releases milt into the opening. The female then backs out of the shell and that water displacement actually pulls the milt into the deeper parts of the shell where it can meet up with the eggs. This can go on for long periods of time, so if you happen to be near the tank at the time, it's pretty easy to spot. Even if you miss the actual spawn, there's a good sign you could look for that a spawn happened recently. If you or another fish startle a female and then she blocks the entrance to her shell and flaps her tail around like this, there's a good chance she's guarding eggs or recently hatched fry. At this point, I think it's a good idea to remove other fish from the tank. Females will raid each other's shells, and even the male parents aren't above eating some of the fry. We often hear shell dwellers talked about in terms of a colony that gradually increases in size, but if your goal is maximum productivity, I think it really comes down to awareness and timing. If the majority of fry don't get eaten, you can actually get fairly large spawns. I'll show you that in just a moment. Typical of other dwarf cichlids, from the time the eggs are laid to when you actually see fry might be 8 to 10 days. As soon as they can move and eat, they'll start coming out of the shell to look for food. This is actually the part I was most worried about. 
I remember reading about how the parents positioned the openings of their shells in the direction of water flow to bring small food particles into the shell, and to me, that sounded really difficult to replicate in an aquarium. It turns out, though, that feeding the fry is really easy. When they're hungry, they will show themselves. You don't have to guess when to start feeding. They're also large enough after hatching to eat baby brine shrimp right away. So once you see fry, you can just target feed some brine shrimp right on top of the shell. If they end up inside the shell, great. If not, the fry will come out and find them. The first spawn I saw was from a younger, smaller female, and I counted 11 fry, which I was totally happy with at the time. About a week later, though, in another tank, I got a second spawn from a larger female, and that time I got about 50. At first, both the mother and the young fry are easily startled and will dart back into the shell if you surprise them. If you remove all the other fish from the tank, though, and try not to spook them, they'll eventually relax and stay out in the open, even when you get near the tank to feed. From this point, if you just feed them two or three times a day and keep the water clean, there isn't much else to it. You've got yourself some fish. They stay together near the mother for the first few weeks, but as they get larger, they spread out around the tank, and once they're about three quarters of an inch long, they'll start moving sand around near shells and sparring with each other. I haven't seen a mother pose any threat to the fry, and with so many in one tank, the fry don't get much opportunity to form territory, and that, in general, helps to limit aggression. If you want to try this yourself, I think my primary recommendations would be to have two or more tanks set up in case you need to move some fish around, and be sure to buy a big enough group to ensure you get a mix of males and females, maybe four to six. Altogether, though, this wasn't too difficult, so I wish you good luck, and I'll see you next time.